we go. One, two, three. Okay. Are we on? Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Resources for Interpreters webinar series. We started this uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. We're at number nine today. It's Trauma Basics for Interpreters When Trauma is in the Room, Foreign Language Interpreting About Traumatic Experiences. Uh, quick housekeeping item for all of you joining us. Uh, it is worth one CEU. Actually, the specifics of the CEU, um, Mira will, will let us know, but ATA, CCHI, MBCMI, IMIA, you do get CAUs for, for attending this webinar series. And today we actually have Lisa Fontes that will be joining us. Um, before I get to her bio, I wanted to mention if everyone, we'll probably repeat this a little bit later, but questions for CCC, if you could put those in the chat. If you have questions for Lisa Fontes, please put those in the Q&A. And so everyone will be trickling in for the next few minutes. As we know, Zoom doesn't let everyone in at the same time. But uh, I want to quickly introduce our speaker. So Lisa Fontes um, is a PhD. She's an internationally known expert on interpreting, child abuse, intimate partner abuse, and sexual violence. Uh, as a researcher, activist, expert witness, and author, she works to protect the most vulnerable people from violence. She's written many journal articles and books, including Invisible Chains, Overcoming Coercive Control in Your Intimate Relationship, Interviewing Clients Across Cultures, Child Abuse in Culture, Working with Diverse Families. Uh, Dr. Fontes is a senior lecturer at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studi Studies, excuse me, she has worked as a family, individual, and group psychotherapist and has conducted research in Santiago, Chile, and with diverse peoples in the United States. Dr. Fontes is a popular conference speaker and workshop facilitator. She bought blogs for publications including psychologytoday.com and domesticshelters.org. In 2016, Dr. Fontes participated in a European summit on interpreting for children in crisis in Budapest. Uh, she has written several chapters on interpreting for people in crisis. So um, without further ado, I don't know, Mira, uh, Marjorie, was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, it's it's pretty, certainly pretty just excited, pretty, uh, pretty thrilled, a little bit awestruck. <laughs> Definitely yeah. very grateful that Lisa's joining us. I think it'll be a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and sorry, Marjorie, didn't want to cut you off there. No, no, no problem at all. I just, I just wanted to add that CCC historically has been a tremendous supporter, and I personally as well of uh, trauma-informed interpreting, interpreting for survivors who've really been through the most terrible things. And so it's a special opportunity to have Lisa, who has expertise in so many different areas, both on the trauma side as a clinician and on the interpreting side. So very excited to have her. And for those of you who are concerned about C uh, CUs, CCHI, ATA, RID. NBCMI, all, all of them have been procured for this particular webinar. Within 24 hours, you will uh, get an email with um, a link to your certificate, a link to uh, the recording for this webinar. Uh, so rest assured that that will come, but the CUs are only for those who attend live. Uh, something else to remember. Uh, without further ado, I think we can hand over the presentation, unless you have something to add, John, into the capable hands no, of Lisa. No. Very excited, very excited. Thank okay. you, Lisa. We'll be back sure. to ask you questions, Lisa. Great. We'll be back in a little while. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John, and thank you so much, uh, Marjorie. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here um, today. It's very exciting to see all the people popping up in the chat announcing where they're from and, and honestly how many people are here today. It's really a good crowd, um, and I am a big fan of interpreters. Um, I think it's uh, the work that you do is just so important. And I have worked closely with interpreters. I've done a little community interpreting myself. Um, in that book that you see there, Interviewing Clients Across Cultures, I have a chapter on interpreting in interviews and a different chapter on interviewing with children and another chapter on interviewing people who for whom English is not their first language. 
And so um, it, this certainly is a topic that I've thought a lot about, um, and I'm really glad to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you about it today, although, of course, it's not going to be enough time. Um, okay. So I don't really think that there's going to be anything in this presentation which will be upsetting to people, um, but I did want to have the content warning there that I usually have when I do presentations on, let's say, child abuse or intimate partner violence, because it's part of the general message that interpreters need to take care of themselves when they're doing the work. And that is a message that they may not get, may not be a central part of your training. Um, but just as um, therapists, social workers, and so on need to take care of themselves when they're working with trauma, so do you. And that will be the final part of the presentation. So here's where we intersect. Um, most of you are professional interpreters. Um, I work on teaching interdisciplinary studies at the University of Massachusetts, which is an online adult co degree completion program. And by the way, the University of Massachusetts Amherst has, I believe, the only online program in the U.S. bachelor's program in interpreting and translation, I believe, run by the very capable Chris Matze. Where we intersect is interpreting on um, issues of trauma and interpreting for people who've been traumatized, even if their traumatic pasts are not a central part of the topic of the interview. So um, I hope this will be fruitful for you. Um, all of you have interpreted for traumatized people, um, whether trauma was the topic of the discussion or not. Trauma, traumatic experiences are so common, and um, for many people, the last couple of years of the COVID pandemic has added to the numbers of people who are traumatized. So all of you who have interpreted have interpreted for people who are traumatized. Many of you, of course, have interpreted in situations where the trauma was being discussed. Um, so that the traumatic incidents were the topic of discussion, and that could have been in a variety of settings. I hope that I can address some of the issues that have come up for you, and we're going to leave some time at the end for your questions, comments, and disagreements. It's all welcome here. Um, I know about traumas, interviews, and, and language a bit, and you know more about interpreting, and you probably know more about a lot of things as well, and I do hope we'll be able to get some back and forth going. My presentation has two parts. Um, the first part is really what is trauma and how it can show up in an interpreted conversation. And the second part is about strategies for coping with the emotional impact of interpreting for trauma. So as interpreters, you hear stories, you sit with people who are really um, shaken, devastated in a range of ways and um, we have, I have some ideas for how to cope with that, and we can also talk more about that in the um, question period. So a person with a trauma history can be triggered talking about something that doesn't have to do with trauma. Like, let's say you say, I can't deal with child abuse. I don't want to interpret child abuse forensic interviews. Okay, you might say that, and therefore you would not interpret in a child advocacy center. But you could be interpreting in a situation that seems not to have to, have to have to do with trauma and issues of trauma could certainly come up and might be triggered for the person who has a trauma history. So, for instance, in a housing interview or in a ha conversation about housing, um, routine medical care, uh, some something to do with money, banking, um, immigration issues certainly bring up a lot of uh, traumatic uh, incidents from the past, and then in even something as you know seemingly sort of as routine and mundane as insurance could trigger traumatic memories for people. So one cannot really decide if you're going to be an interpreter that you're not going to interpret in situations with trauma. Um, they're gonna, it's going to be there. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about people, interpreters who are not trained in trauma and things they might think or do. Uh, or feel. And many of you might say, I would never do that. I'm too professional for that. Why is she insulting me? So please, I don't mean to insult you. Okay. If it doesn't apply to you, just, I acknowledge that it doesn't apply to you, but these are things that I know that have happened have, and um, things that people have felt and done. So I, I'm going to mention them, um, but I, I'm not saying it to hurt your feelings or to in any way undercut your professionalism. <clears throat> 
So an interpreter who's not trained in trauma might misunderstand the client, I'm gonna use the word client, um, their emotional displays. Um, it would be natural that, that an interpreter might feel irritated when a client weeps, you know, why is she crying so much? Um, it's hard to interpret when she's crying because she's speaking in a muffled voice or she's looking down. Um, if the client screams, um, seems overly dramatic, if they seem upset or angry, or if they speak quietly or incoherently, if you're not trained in trauma, that might trigger feelings of rejection in you towards the person that you're interpreting for. You might dislike a person you're interpreting for because of their manner. Um, the way that they're interacting might turn you off. And if you're not familiar with trauma, it would be natural to allow that negative feeling to overtake the way you interact. You might misinterpret nonverbals. If somebody is looking down, if somebody is fidgeting, you might think that that means that the person is lying and therefore that might uh, shape or color in part the way you interpret. You might try to clean up the person's language. Now I know that's a no-no interpreting, but I've seen it happen. Um, so you might want to suppress curse words. Um, you might want to suppress baby talk. You might want to not interpret incoherent phrases that the person has said, excuse me. Um, or it might be difficult for you to discuss sexual matters. All of that is important um, to convey as the client uh, conveys it. If you're not um, trained in trauma, you might misunderstand a professional comments or questions and think they're inappropriate or overly intrusive or repetitive or insulting to the limiting English proficiency person or the LEP's cultural group. Now, let me give you um, examples um, for this. Um, I have done a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work training uh, interviewers and other staff at child advocacy centers. These are centers where children are interviewed when there's a suspicion of child sexual abuse or severe physical abuse, or maybe a child who's witnessed a homicide. And the forensic interviewers have to be very careful about how they say things um, so that they don't lead the person they're interviewing. But once the interviewee has said a word, they can repeat it. Um, so it it is a very peculiar, it can be, it, it, the best interviewers do it in a very natural way, but if you're interpreting, it may seem a little weird, like, oh, why are they asking that same question again? They only changed one word. Um, why are they, why do they need such details about the sexual acts? Well, they need them because it might determine the charges, the legal charges that could be filed. Um, and so a, a little background in trauma uh, will help you interpret in those kinds of situations and others better. Uh, you may be tempted to take control um, to answer a client's question without conveying the question to the interviewer. Of course, interpreters are not supposed to do that, but there's some research in the medical field that shows that sometimes professional interpreters do. You might fail to empathize with the person um, being interviewed. Um, you might try to shame them argue with them or condescend to them. Now, again, please don't, I'm not trying to insult you, but I'm, I'm just um, hoping that talking about trauma will help you avoid some of these potential traps. An interpreter who isn't trained in trauma might deny, might think that the person is lying, that these awful things could not have happened because you know what? It's a lot of awful things out there. And um, unless you're in the field like I am, sometimes, you can't even imagine what, what's really going on. Um, it's easy to deny. You might show bias. You might try to influence a victim's statements um, without even realizing that that's what you're doing. Um, you might fail to maintain confidentiality because you're so blown away with what happened. You just have to go and talk to somebody and you might not have the support you need in terms of supervision or peer supervision or the right context to process because we do need context to process what's going on. You might, if a person who's being um, interviewed or in a conversation is very upset, you may want to intervene to calm them or to soothe them. And that would be a really natural, humane impulse, um, but is probably not going to be appropriate to the situation.
So what is trauma? Um, various definitions. People talk about three E's. There's an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and it has lasting effects. So if something happens, but it doesn't really seem to affect anybody, we don't talk about it as being um, traumatic. Um, so it has to have all those three elements for us to consider it trauma. Now this is, I'm gonna give you like a really basic 101 course on the trauma response um, system. And please uh, look into it further. Um, there's uh, Oprah Winfrey wrote, wrote a book with Bruce Perry, who's just a brilliant psychologist who works on trauma. And um, I think the book is called What Happened to You? And that goes into this in much greater depth. So you can certainly find a lot more uh, in-depth information available about there. So our brains, the outer layer of our brains, the neocortex is the most recent um, invention, if you want to call that um, evolutionarily. Um, the inner part of the brain, the brain stem, and uh, outside that, the limbic system are more primitive or are present in um, animals that are um, less evolved than primates, let's say. Um, so you can talk about the thinking brain being the outside part and the emotional brain being what goes on in the inside. Of course, there's lots of communication back and forth. So this is kind of an oversimplification. Yeah. So when there's a threat, whether that is a sudden um, uh, something in your peripheral vision that you think might 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 be an animal or an intruder or a loud noise that frightens you or um, someone says something that fright frightens you uh, maybe you're driving and you're you think you're about to get in an accident the amygdala the primitive emotional brain senses it before the um the thinking brain on the outside. I mean, maybe you touch something hot. Have you ever had done that? You touch something hot and you remove your finger even before you're, you have consciously thought that's hot. The thinking brain assesses the situation and says, and, and makes some kinds of rational decision, some kind of decision about what to do about the situation. So if you see something in your peripheral vision and then you're, um, rational brain, your thinking brain says to you, oh, that was just a leaf falling from a tree, then all is well, you've used your thinking to process it and your body calms down. But if the brain, if the thinking brain says, oh my gosh, that person is coming at me with a knife, then a lot of times the thinking brain goes offline and you respond physically in a more primitive way. So your emotional brain activates the fight, freeze, or flee response. It releases hormones, your pulse is raised, your hands get sweaty, and so on. Um, and that's a traumatic response. Um, I'll say the fourth F is fawning, which is trying to please somebody who is threatening you, but that comes a little bit later on. When the danger has passed, the thinking brain helps shut off the alarm and calm us down. So um, you're um, crossing the street, you see something out of your peripheral vision, you're afraid you're gonna get hit, you jump back and all of that. Um, and then your thinking brain says, okay, the car passed, I didn't get hit, I'm okay. And you can calm yourself down. An experience is traumatic when it overwhelms this usual response, um, this usual system for responding to stress. Then we talk about toxic stress. The emotional brain continues to sound the alarm and sends messages to fight, freeze, or flee even after the threat has passed. So the person is in a chronic state of survival mode. So let's say the threat is not a car that you thought was gonna hit you when you were crossing the street, but the threat is somebody you live with and have to see on a daily basis or a regular basis, and your fear is constant um, or frequent. It may not be constant, but is, is frequent. Your body may be in this chronic state of survival mode of a rapid pulse, hormones flowing, and um, that is a has all kinds of health e effects. So think again about some of the people you may be interpreting for who are fleeing war, 
um, fleeing natural disaster have had a long and horrible journey to the US, let's say, um, they may be experiencing a chronic state of over um, stimulation. So traumas are really different. Um, some are one time, some happen multiple times, and some are chronic. So they're day in, day out, living with hunger, maybe day in, day out. Um, living in a war is day in, day out. Um, repeated might be um, being attacked, you know, three times um, or getting, you know, maybe bullied at school a number of times, but it's, you know, you're okay on the weekends, you're okay in the summer. Some are natural, so a natural disaster, um, a flood and so on. Um, of course, a lot of those natural disasters have to do with climate change, which isn't entirely natural, but we'll just leave it there for a second. And some are inflicted with benign intent. So for instance, a medical procedure could be traumatic, even though the intent was to save a person's life. And some are inflicted with what I'll just call evil intent. So that could be um, a physical assault, um, and, and abuse, um, war. Some are inflicted by a loved one. Some are inflicted by a known person. So maybe a clergy member, a teacher, a neighbor, and some are inflicted by strangers. Some are shared. So like the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of trauma happening that's shared by people. On the other hand, some traumas are individual. So there may be a shared experience of going through the pandemic, but if you have had the misfortune of having a loved one perish from the pandemic in the hospital all alone, and you've seen their face as you, you know, Zoomed with them or spoke with them on the phone or whatever it is, maybe you got into the, the COVID ward, you have your also your individual trauma related to this more global trauma. Um, some are witnessed. Um, so for instance, if children see their um, mom being um, beaten up by uh, their father or stepfather or, or boyfriend or, or girlfriend for that matter, and some are experienced directly. Um, different types of trauma, there's family trauma, including abuse, neglect, domestic abuse, the incarceration of a family member is traumatic, family substance abuse may be traumatic, the loss of a loved one. Um, is also traumatic. Um, there's a lot of trauma for immigrants and refugees, as you know. War, political violence, ethnic violence, torture, forced displacement, migration, and acculturation stressors. So the stressors that happen once people have immigrated to the U.S., threats of deportation, natural disasters have often um, spurred um, immigration. Medical traumas um, are big and a lot of people have had them. So pain, injury, a serious illness, an invasive medical procedure or treatment can be traumatic. Poverty is um, traumatic in both um, acute, so um, particular instances and also in chronic ways. So having a lack of resources, a lack of support networks, lack of mobility, um, financial stressors, homelessness, hunger uh, can all be traumatic. And then discrimination is also traumatic, racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, and so on. Um, we talk about complex trauma, and I would encourage you to read more about that. Um, complex trauma is what people may suffer from who've been exposed to multiple traumatic events from an early age. It alters how the brain develops. It can also be called developmental trauma. So for instance, um, a child who grows up in a home with um, violence, um, they may be subjected to physical or sexual violence themselves. They may witness uh, one of their family members um, being abused. Um, that has, it may alter, alter the way they develop, the way they relate to others. Um, they have the cr that chronic, chronic state of overstimulation. Um, complex trauma interrupts the coordination of the thinking and the feeling parts of the brain. So if a child is constantly exposed to danger, then they their feeling brain may become more active and the thinking brain used to solve problems may become less active. That said, there are people who draw, grow up in, in homes with a lot of trauma who become really adept at using their thinking brain to figure things out, figure out safety for themselves and other family members. So there's no absolute rule on how this happens. 
if a person grows up in a situation of chronic trauma, they're chronically focused on survival, leaves less energy, less time, less space to focus on school, relationships, and so on. So they can become really developmentally delayed in some of these other aspects of life. Important to talk about historical trauma, uh, which is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations, which emanates from massive group trauma. In other words, historically, certain groups of people experience trauma as a group, and that also has effects. Um, some examples, the trauma faced by American Indian and Alaska Native communities with genocides, with forced migrations, with deprivation of rights, with um, schools, um, forced residential schools. African-American descendants of enslaved people um, have inherited a kind of historical trauma. Descendants of Holocaust survivors, Japanese-American survivors of internment camps during the Second World War, LGBTQ communities and other expressed, uh, sorry, oppressed and exploited communities um, have historical trauma. Um, I hope many of you have heard about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and um, they can lead to ailments as adults. I shouldn't have written the word lead to, that's not exactly, um, not exactly the, what I would prefer to say, <laughs> um, but it, they can contribute to ailments as adults. So a study was done by Kaiser Permanente that found that um, certain, uh, many um, physical ailments in adults, including cancer, heart disease, um, and others were correlated with certain adverse experiences in childhood. Um, those the experiences are destabilizing, so they're trauma. Um, they lead children to having difficulty concentrating in school. Too much mental space is occupied with the trauma. Um, kids have have to use energy to make sure themselves and others are safe. They may feel guilty, and their worries become physical ailments and disease over time. And um, the original ten um, aces have. Since in the years since this was published, we found that there are other ACEs, there are other adverse childhood experiences which contribute to ill health in adults, including experiences of racism, experiences of poverty, and corporal punishment, even non abusive corporal punishment, legal corporal punishment. Corporal punishment is legal in the US, um, in every state. Um, even that is correlated with um, adult. Uh, illness and disease. But traumas are really common. Um, two thirds of children experience at least one. Um, so psychological, physical, or sexual abuse, community or school violence, exposure to intimate partner violence, national, natural disasters or terrorism, medical traumas, parental loss or injury, neglect, Accidents, accidents are traumatizing. Yeah, getting a bad, bad car accident, very can be very traumatizing. Crime, war, hunger, and so on. So um, yes, traumas are awful, but they're also really, really common. The problem is when people experience more than one trauma, and the more they experience, the more likelihood they are of having trouble coping. Um, up to two people seem to do okay if they have a supportive family environment, but more than two um, people can really struggle. Now, a lot of people who've had more than two traumas go on and have wonderful, productive lives. I mean, you can look at Oprah Winfrey, you can look at Trevor Noah. Um, there's so many um, people who have Maya Angelou who've had difficult early years with multiple traumas and are doing great but it's harder and uh, they're more likely to have um, disease. Now, this is especially important for you as interpreters. Trauma affects memory and how people talk about their experiences. So when people are talking about traumatic events or when people have been traumatized and maybe talking about non-traumatic events, the way they tell about them may be non-linear. So, of of course, it's easy for us if people say this happened, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But that's not the way people tell 
about what happened in many cultures and also trauma can make that less likely to happen. So the, the way they tell what stories, the way they tell history may be nonlinear and quite disjointed, therefore harder for people to follow, including the interpreter. They may shift perspective. So they're telling the story using the first person, I, and then they suddenly switch to you, or they suddenly switch, you know, using you colloquially, colloquially, or they suddenly shift and tell it as if it was happening to somebody else. They may shift languages. So they're speaking in, um, you know, English, and then they're shifting to Spanish, or they're speaking in Spanish, and then they um, switch to a, lang a Mayan language uh, without even realizing it. Um, people may regress. Um, children and teens may suddenly start talking like a much younger person if they're talking about a trauma that happened to them when they were young. All emotional expressions are possible. Um, people may have what we call flat affect, so therefore they look like they're not experiencing a lot emotionally. They may be crying. They may be smiling. They may be laughing. They may show anger. They may show despair. They may be virtually frozen and unable to talk, so catatonic. Um, I, I wanna really emphasize this because you may have in your mind an idea about how people would talk about trauma if it was real. And I wanna tell you that there's a whole range of expressions um, when people talk about trauma that's real. So don't expect that they have to be crying or it's not real or they had this weird smile and that might mean they're lying, not at all. People talk about trauma in different ways. People may be emotionally labile, in other words, unstable. So they're they're crying, they're laughing, they're sighing, they're angry, you know, all in a, a given conversation, which can be really hard for you to follow as an interpreter if you're also trying to, in some ways, match the emotional presentation of the person who's speaking. They may enter an altered state, like a trance, while they're telling about a traumatic memory uh, that may be really unnerving to you. And they could be very matter of fact with no emotional expression as well. Why is it especially hard to talk about trauma? Well, the topics that are involved in trauma are often taboo. You know, it could involve sex, could involve violence, could involve the pri pri privacy of the family. Um, the stakes may be very high, um, deportation, um, arrest, um, breaking up of families. There may be shame involved, even for people who've been victimized to say nothing about people who victimize others. Trauma itself affects the way people integrate memories. So if you think about the different things that you remember from um, in your life, um, some things are probably easy to recall, some things are difficult to recall, some things you hate to recall. Um, and trauma is a, traumatic memories seem to be encoded in a different way from other kinds of memories. When people are under stress, they often want to speak with someone familiar, but you're probably interpreting in a situation that doesn't feel familiar at all. Um, the interpreter makes the conversation possible, but also strange. Um, what are some adult symptoms? You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go, sorry, I'm going to go down because we have a lot um, that we want to do. So I'm just going to skip two slides here. So I want to talk now about the interpreter and the interpreter's own um, feelings and own experience of, of interpreting a conversation about trauma. Interpreting trauma stimulates our own feelings. Um, it's hard to not have a feeling response if you're interpreting somebody talking about a traumatic incident. Are you feeling protective? Are you feeling angry? You may be feeling angry towards the client. You may be feeling angry towards the professional. You may be feeling angry towards someone who has done wrong to the person you're interpreting for. Um, how are those feelings affecting you? Um, what happens if you show that anger on your face? It may make it harder for someone to talk, particularly a child who might think that you're angry at them. Are you feeling heartbroken? Are you feeling like den in denial? This couldn't have happened. I don't believe it. They're making it up. It wasn't that bad. Do you feel like crying? I mean, that would be a very natural response to a lot of things that people talk about as well. Are you feeling panicky? 
Are you having a flood of memories of some of your own experiences? That also would be very common, especially if you come from um, a similar background to the pe person you're interpreting for. And maybe your experiences are like those of the person you're interpreting for, and maybe you really haven't processed them enough. Um, so it would be natural to have a lot of feelings. Try to set aside your strong feelings during the interview so your voice can be clear. In other words, not, I can't think about that, but just, I will come back to that after this conversation's over. What do you do to debrief emotionally after a really hard um, interpreting assignment? Now, let's say you're interpreting in a mental health situation or a social work situation, uh, maybe even a criminal justice situation. Probably everybody else in the room has some kind of training on how to handle trauma. Um, they've, they've talked about it in class. They've talked about burnout. They've talked about um, self-management, secondary trauma, vic secondary victimization, and so on. You may not have that, that training. They're likely to be part of a team. So after this really difficult conversation, they may be able to process it with each other. Do you have a team of people who you can process your difficult interpreting assignments with? You probably should. Um, it will help prevent you from burning out and it'll help you do better work. Um, they may have clinical supervision. So if they're in a clinical role, they may have a clinical supervisor who can talk with them about things that came up for them during this conversation. They may be in therapy themselves. Again, if you're from the same ethnic group um, as the limited English proficiency person or have had similar experiences, it may be especially important for you to debrief. Interpreting about trauma is grueling. Um, for my book, Interviewing Clients Across Cultures, I interviewed my good friend, um, Ilya Cornier, who is a, um, in, a interpreting trainer or was, maybe she still is, I'm not sure, in the courts in Massachusetts, as well as a very experienced court interpreter. And this is one thing she said to me, the worst time for me, the worst time interpreting um, and her in terms of feelings was when I was interpreting the victim impact statement of a sadistic rape. The young girl read page after page about how awful her life had been since the rape. She was weeping while she was reading the statement, and I was repeating everything, speaking in the first person and using the word I as if it had happened to me. I was trying to put emphasis where she put emphasis and convey in my speech as much as I could the feelings she was conveying. At the end, the court took a recess and I went to the bathroom, splashed water on my face, and was supposed to walk right into the next courtroom and begin working on the next case. I was shaking like a leaf. Now, just reading this, the statement from this interpreter, I'm feeling moved. I'm really identifying with her and feeling a little shaken myself. Um, so those feelings do come um, to the front and we need to pay attention to them. So here's some things you can do. Um, and, and this ABC thing is not original to me. You can find more information about it online. Um, as sort of a burnout prevention in a variety of fields um, that have to do with, with mental health and trauma. So the ABCs um, of taking care of yourself, you'll need awareness, balance, connection, as well as everything else that you already do and, and do well. Some parts of awareness, build habits of self-reflection. Ask yourself throughout the day, when you're working, but also when you're home, when you're with your family, when you're alone, um, just build habits of checking in with yourself. How am I doing right now? Paying attention to yourself, how you're feeling, what's going on for you? What am I feeling? What's going on in my body? You know, you may be, if you ask yourself this multiple times a day, put it in your phone that it comes up, I don't know, you know, every 45 minutes or something. Uh, how am I doing right now? You know, you may say, gee, I'm not sure how I'm doing, but I feel a certain tightness in my chest. What does that mean? So you're learning to tune into your own signals. What are my own personal triggers? So what are the kinds of things that people talk about in the conversations that you interpret that um, upset you um, or in your personal life as well? Um, it's okay to decide that you do not want to interpret certain kinds of conversations. However, there's no guarantee it's not going to come up. 
So you may say, I don't want to interpret issues of child sexual abuse, and therefore you don't interpret in a child advocacy center. Okay. But if you're interpreting in a law enforcement setting, if you're interpreting in a medical setting, those issues may still come up. Prepare yourself for sessions um, that you know are going to be difficult. Um, exercise, rest, pause before you go in, meditate, pray, whatever works for you. So that was awareness, now balance. Um, okay, I don't mean to sound like your mother here, um, but daily physical activity um, will help you get balanced. Just, just walking every day. Um, develop and maintain activities outside work. Um, work alone is not enough. Develop a mindfulness practice. For some people, that'll be meditation. For other people, that might be prayer. Take some time for yourself. It's hard if you have a lot of family responsibilities, work responsibilities, but try to take a little bit of time for yourself each day to center, figure out what's going on. And therapy can be helpful. And do what's worked in the past and then add on more. So you might know, you know, for me, it's a hot bath, it's a walk. If the weather's good, a swim are wonderful for like getting me back on a good track. Connection is the third thing. So um, awareness, balance, and connection. Supervision or share vision. Share vision is a peer supervision. So a lot of people work in settings where they don't have a supervisor, but maybe if you have a colleague who you trust, you can meet regularly and talk about things that are going on and also rely on each other for those occasional, oh my gosh, I've got to talk to somebody kinds of situations. Obviously, you're not going to do it in a public place where anybody could overhear you. Important to have connections with friends, with family. Um, this has all been really hard in the pandemic. Um, to have connections with your community or your communities. Many of us belong to more than one community. And then personal psychotherapy can also be um, helpful at, at different points. I always see therapy as like education. Um, you know, it's good to go back and keep learning, keep discovering, tune up at different points in our lives. Some strategies that can make it easier to interpret conversations about trauma, um, make rituals around the transition between work and home. So if you interpret difficult conversations, allow yourself certain rituals that will help you know on a gut level that now you're switching. So here are some things that work, you know, change your clothes. Um, a lot of people who work um, in trauma have um, work clothes and home clothes and maybe just a couple of outfits for work clothes. And even if you're, let's say you're interpreting from home, changing your clothes will psychologically tell yourself, I'm switching gears here. Shower or brush your teeth when you're done with work. Again, like ritually washing off that painful material. Um, close things um, that may sound like fun, funny, but, you know, well, back in the day, we used to close file folders. Nowadays, we may not have file folders, but we may have um, folders on our desktop or just turn off your computer or close the door to your office or whatever it is. You know, if you have a, a bag or a purse, you know, just your work one, close it up at the end of the day. Again, signaling to yourself, turn off a light switch that you're done. Maybe there's a certain music that you play on your walk home or your drive home or just at the end of your day while you're picking up your space. That again is just that transition music. Can you take a brief walk um, when you're done with that, either that difficult session or your, or your difficult day um, just to clear your head? And then it's easy to feel despairing if you work with trauma day in, day out. I work with trauma day in, day out, and I know sometimes I feel despairing. Um, so what are some things that can help keep trauma at bay? One is to remind ourselves that the trauma is probably in the past, um, you know, may not be depending on what the trauma is. Um, the conversation that you're having and that you are playing a role in is probably going to bring some assistance. Um, a at the very least, a seed has been planted through that conversation and we can hope it will bear fruit. And then also I remind myself that survivors um, can be remarkably resilient um, and some grow after trauma. Um, you can Google post-traumatic growth or post-traumatic resilience to learn more about that. So and even, even if you feel like you're, you're peeking into the very um, darkest, um, saddest part of humanity, which you might be, 
um, know that you're also seeing people at a really bad time and, and that things will look different in a month, in a year, in 10 years. So I wanna thank you for your commitment to quality interpreting with traumatized people so that every trauma victim or, or survivor can be heard, understood and respected and receive the best possible professional response. Um, those are my books. There's my email. I'd be happy to hear from you. And I guess um, I'll be hearing from you now uh, through uh, questions and answers. So let me stop Lisa, sharing my screen. That was remarkable. Um, it's 12.15. We had talked about <laughs> us chiming in, maybe 12.10. And Mira and I were just, <laughs> we, we couldn't, we couldn't. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was really, really critical information. Um, I know community interpreters staff interpreters at hospitals, interpreters in educational settings, interpreters uh, in government settings and nonprofits, day in and day out, they wrestle with, with everything you talked about. Um, so uh, awareness, balance, connection. How am I doing right now? So much information, but we do have um, a few questions for you. Oh, yes. Um, how do we interpret weeping, shouting, uh, these came in through the Q&A, so thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. How do we interpret weeping, shouting? We don't weep or shout. How do we give voice to these large emotions? I think that's an interpreting question rather than a, a question for me. So, um, John and Mira, let me defer to I, you on that one. It's. I was hoping, actually, to, to hear your perspective on it, but they teach in interpreting, and then you can respond to this. Um, and, and John and I have certainly dealt with this uh, as questions from interpreters is not to go flat or wooden or monotone, but to render the emotion less intensively. So if someone is crying, you don't cry as the interpreter, but you do try to sound sad and convey the sadness. Similarly, if someone is angry, you might raise your voice a bit. You're, you're not shouting if, you, if they're shouting, but you're still conveying anger, but not escalating. One of the concerns I do hear about interpreters though is, is where is that line drawn where you might be escalating, but you want to convey. So I don't know if you have, Anything that you would like to share about that, that question, that's a, that's a tricky question for an interpreter. Right. We're not right. conditions. Right. Well, in most situations, wouldn't the, um, the interviewer, let's say, be hearing and seeing the client's displays anyway, so that they would, you know, be able to see that, um, this person is yelling and, um, they just don't know what the yelling means necessarily. So the interpreter would be giving voice to their words, as well as, as you say, conveying to a limited extent the, the depth of feeling. So as, as a clinician, you're on board with the standard. Oh, uh, definitely. And, and someone wrote, they're supposed to look at the person, not the interpreter, absolutely. Um, so that hopefully the, um, they, they will be doing that and seeing the strength of feeling. My, my, my experience is clinicians are a lot better at that than your average uh, service providers and even healthcare providers actually looking at their clients. Yeah. Um, I have a, a question, how, how to best advise the interviewer who keeps saying to the interpreter repeatedly, ask him, her, tell me now. I, I thought, oh, that's gotta be a healthcare provider, right? But no, this person adds, this has happened to me. And I've noticed it a lot in CAC interviews, child advocacy interviews. Um, and, and so I don't know who is, is, is the service provider in question, hopefully not clinicians, but that's, that's pretty, that's a difficult setting, a child advocacy center. What do you suggest the interpreter mm. does in that situation? Ask him, ask her, the provider. Right, right, right. So um, I also just want to respond. Somebody asked how they could buy my books and they're available. Um, my last three books were with guilford.com. Um, somebody can maybe put that into the chat but um also if you google me they'll pop up they're available you know at your standard um websites and bookstores and a lot of libraries as well um so what can you do um <laughs> well i do trainings at child advocacy centers and i'm constant and one of the poor i do trainings on on cultural competence at child advocacy centers and one of the things i talk about all the time is interpreting and i say exactly that address the child directly However, of course, you know, people may not. Um, so in fact, I, I have um, webinar for interpreters that's available on the web on 
I'm sorry, not for interpreters, for people working with interpreters on how to work inter with interpreters. And I say precisely that. Uh, I don't I don't have any you know secret here except you know to say um you know take maybe a pause and John and Mary can tell me if this is is acceptable to take a pause and say please speak to her and not to me. Yeah, absolutely. It's that's just a, a a small intervention, and you always, as an interpreter, as we all know, you you want to call out that you are speaking as the interpreter, and maybe quickly say, as the interpreter, I would like to request that you speak directly to the patient and not to me. And for transparency's sake, you say that in both languages. The other thing that I uh, recommend and for child advocacy centers, and not everybody agrees with me, is that the interpreter sit. Um, sort of to the side and slightly behind mm. the child um, so that the interviewer is facing the child and the child is facing the interviewer. And the child, the first couple of times might turn to see what the interpreter is saying. But if the interviewer is really focusing on the child, the child's focus will also be on um, the interviewer. So that's that fascinating because the, the positioning of everyone, provider, client, patient, interpreter, just it's, there's not a one size fits all. And, and you're advocating obviously with, with some, some judgment on the part of the interpreter, but that they sit behind, that that seems to be the most conducive for, for the scenarios you, you encounter. Yeah. Not, like not like directly behind, not directly but, behind, because yeah, that, <laughs> that would make anybody, that would make anybody paranoid, yeah. but, you know, just sort of slight, slightly next to the, the, the child or the interviewee and, and perhaps slightly behind. And then it, uh, I, I found that that enhances the direct uh, contact between the interviewer and the interviewee. The communication. The... Okay. Uh, here's another, were you gonna Go say ahead. something? Um, so, so much of psychology or medical care in general is trauma, but why are so few therapists trained in trauma? Why are so few providers trained in trauma? We'll try to miss several questions. What kind of medical work is not trauma? Really? It feels like <laughs> it is all trauma in my work and so little awareness. Yeah, I'm laughing just because Thank it's you. just such Wonderful a great, question. great question. <laughs> and um, in a sense, so obvious in the good sense of like, yeah, we should be asking that all the time. So it is... I have, I have so many different thoughts about this. So I think that people are in the, in the mental health field, people are definitely paying more attention to trauma than they used to. Um, but one thing is that the idea of trauma has become kind of popular yes. and um, mm -hmm. there are trauma societies and mm -hmm. courses on trauma, all very, very valuable, but they are not specific necessarily. So if you talk about child abuse, let's say, or violence against women, then you're talking about a problem which there is an obvious solution. You want to prevent those particular things. When you talk about trauma, sometimes what you're talking about is just more therapy. Are you following me? Oh, so yes. I think that um, I think there are certainly medical things which are not trauma. There are rashes and there are, um, you know, there's Sore throats. <laughs> lot, lots of things that, that I think are not trauma. I do think that um, medical prof providers and mental health providers should be a lot better trained, not just in trauma, but in specific um, kinds of abuse. Um, and, and not just abuse, but specific kinds of trauma. I mean, it's interesting that in most states, teachers have to get a certain number of continuing education units in child abuse and neglect periodically, but doctors don't, therapists don't, mm. you know, psychologists don't, social workers don't. Um, and also that, of course, that quality of those trainings can really vary. I feel very fortunate because I, I teach online at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I do teach a course on sexual violence, and I do teach a course on child abuse and neglect, and um, I feel really happy that I'm able to get that that material out there. But um, it's amazing. I mean, people can get their entire doctorate in psychology, let's say, and maybe they'll have a tiny little unit on trauma in a course in psychopathology. It's sad. That's very wow. sad. Um, this is a really interesting question. How to best or better interpret for the victim of sexual trauma when you are summoned as the second more experienced interpreter into the case 
after the first interview was botched in some way. Um, so you're coming into a sensitive situation. Is there anything that would be different from everything that you have just laid out um, today? Or do you have extra words of advice in that more sensitive situation? I mean, I would just assume that all the, any kind of conversation that you need to interpret around um, sexual assault or sexual trauma is going to be sensitive, going to be maximally sensitive. So I would bring my best self, if possible, to every one of those um, interviews and conversations. Um, I think that their nonverbal conversation can be nonverbal communication can be really important. So when you, you know, when you walk into the room and you're introduced, acknowledging the person, you know, not just, you know, hello, but, you know, acknowledging them, you know, maybe leaning forward a little bit, you know, smiling if that feels like the right thing. But, you know, if, if you feel inside, like you're opening up your heart in this situation, I think other people can feel that. And yes. even though that's dangerous as an interpreter in a way, because if you open up your heart, you might be more upset. But I, I do think that that connection, particularly with a survivor of sexual trauma, um, can be can be really, really important. It's, it, 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 it supports the clinician in their quest for unconditional positive regard. I mean, it's, it's instead of interfering with the therapeutic alliance, hopefully then the interpreter is supporting it in some meaningful way. Um, you're, you're talking about compassion, aren't you? Yes, yeah, very much. Yeah, just acknowledging the, the shared humanity we all have. Right. Um, I do it, by the way, I'm sorry to do a little plug here, but in my book, Interviewing Clients Across Cultures, there is a chapter on nonverbal communication that oh, I had wonderful. so much fun writing because there are so many, um, you know, we can't learn all the nonverbal communication of all cultures, but it can be helpful mm -hmm. to, ha first That's of all, have cool. an orientation. But secondly, you know, the more contact you have with people from a given culture, the more you get a sense of what it means. And um, so even like ordinary things that to, for some people, you know, calling somebody like this can be yes. very insulting um, and uh, better to, you know, call them in like this. So I just had a really great time writing that, that um, chapter. What, uh, Dr. Fontes, what did you do in Chile? Oh my gosh, I've been to Chile at least a dozen times since 1995. Um, I worked, the first project there was working with a wonderful community organization, EPES Educación Popular en Salud, on um, child sexual abuse. Um, we did focus groups and then, then I sort of helped them get started on community interventions around child sexual abuse prevention because they couldn't rely on the government for anything. And they've been continuing the work for the remaining decades. And since then I've continued to work with EPES on child sexual abuse, on intimate partner violence, and then also worked um, helping to establish child advocacy centers in Chile. Um, mm -hmm. did some training of judges and prosecutors on um, sexual crimes. And um, I really, I love Chile. <laughs> I feel very close mm -hmm. to Chile and I haven't been since 2019. So I hope we can remedy that. Soon. Um, someone is asking if you can recommend any books on complex trauma. We had quite a few comments, by the way, on mm -hmm. how great it was that you were, you were speaking about that and how important it was. So Bruce Perry is just brilliant. And the, the, he wrote a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. And it has maybe nine or 10 chapters in which he describes the case of a child who was raised with complex trauma, or he would call it developmental trauma, and then the interventions they did to help. It reads like a novel. It's such a good read. Um, and so I do really recommend that one. It, it sounds like it might be very depressing, but actually it's really kind of uplifting. Um, and then the book he did with um, Oprah Winfrey, What Happened to You? Um, Bessel van der Kolk is a very yeah. big name in trauma. And he did a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, yes. That is also, I really recommend. Um, uh, for our audience, uh, I think that is the only book I've ever read where as soon as I finished reading it, I started reading it over again and finished mm. it twice. Which one is that? <laughs> That's the, boy the, book, the Body oh. Keeps the Score. Yeah. 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 That's how good it is. 
Right. Well, we have actually come to the end of our hour. Um, hmm. it, it has been an amazing experience for me personally, because this is an area where, as I mentioned to you, I've devoted a lot of volunteer time uh, over the years and everything you were saying were, was resonating and I was hearing different things, but it all dovetailed with everything I know. Um, some of the questions and answers that you were giving in the present day, we, lots of chat response, lots of resonance, lots of interpreters saying, oh my gosh, this is so important, uh, including, as I mentioned, complex trauma. Uh, we mm -hmm. obviously had people from all over the states uh, tuning in and, and, and many many hundreds as you have seen uh from turkey and dubai and canada and jerusalem and argentina wow. and all kinds of other places as well uh so we can't thank you enough this is really very very generous and kind of you i know for a fact that it is a very underestimated problem in the field for interpreters not having enough information about trauma vicarious trauma wanting to do the right thing not knowing and you really shared a lot of expertise today and and we are sincerely grateful Thank yes. you. Thank you all thank for the work you, you do. And thank you, um, John and, and Marjorie for the for the work you do as well and for this opportunity. And Wonderful. people have my email. I'm easy to find if you want to Google me. So thank you. So awesome. they will get uh, everyone will get a, a, an email tomorrow with a link to to the recording of the webinar and also to your certificate with with the CEUs. So look out for that. And uh, meantime, wishing you a wonderful rest of your day. Hope you get back to uh, to Chile soon. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Thank John. Thank you, Dr. Von. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.